Just to reiterate what uh, Rory was saying, we were born effectively about two decades ago when we were invited to become, uh, to have an MRC unit within CTSU. And since then we've had a number of quinquennial reviews, five yearly reviews of our funding and steadily have incrementally increased our support from the MRC, for which we're very grateful. And then in July uh, of 2013, it was a perfect storm. We, we became the Nuffield Department of Population Health. We were preparing for the REF, and we, became, uh, uh, we got involved in discussions about uh, the QQR and what would happen after that. So by July 2016, we were in a position to uh, create the uh, MRC PHRU at the University of Oxford. And as you know, 60 of you transferred to the University of Oxford and we have a strategic alliance agreement between the parties, a formal document that sets out how we are to operate with each other uh, in, in ways that will enhance the science uh, uh, that we are doing. So back in 2013, we wrote that our long-term aims uh, were to generate and disseminate reliable evidence from observational epidemiology, from randomised trials, um, and those that lead to practicable methods of avoiding premature death and disability. And that's really been, uh, we don't really like the idea of a mission statement, but it is really a mission statement for, uh, uh, for, the, for the CTSU and now for PHRU. And historically, we've tended to focus on cancer and vascular disease, and it might be worth <coughs> reflecting why we do that. At the moment, there are about 130 million births every year, and it's worthwhile thinking about uh, what those people will eventually die from. And we can project that there'll be about 20 million deaths before middle age, uh, and then 40 million in middle age. And those deaths in middle age are, as well as those, of course, in young age, are potentially avoidable. But we focused on middle age, trying to avoid deaths in middle age, and of course, not just deaths, but serious disability in middle age. <coughs> So just to reiterate what Rory was saying, uh, we've had long-term stable support from the MRC and that has allowed us to do what we now are able to do. Without that support, we wouldn't have been able to get to the position we're in now. I just want to rehearse for a moment just some of the highlights of what we have achieved over the years before looking forward. So we are uh, well known for our work on tobacco, Richard Pito led the way with prospective studies in various parts of the world, particularly China in conjunction with uh, Zen Ming Chen sitting in the audience. Uh, and our work in breast cancer has been especially important in improving uh, survival uh, after early breast cancer. And the way in which that has worked is that we've run randomized trials and conducted large international meta-analyses of randomized trials by ourselves and others that have identified reliably moderate gains in, in survival. And it's by piling those moderate gains one on top of each other, uh, there has been a resulting improvement in uh, outcome after breast cancer. So to illustrate, uh, this is just a few of the things that the early breast cancer um, trialist group has done over the years. There are lots and lots of papers, uh, most of them in the Lancet, probably five or maybe ten papers in even the last uh, decade or so. So here we see uh, survival curves for uh, anthracyclines versus control um, in women who are estrogen receptor negative and estrogen receptor positive. And you can see that for both of those, after about ten years, allocation to an anthracycline has Reduce mortality at 10 years by 6 or 7% in both cases. And this might be seen as a moderate gain, maybe uh, not particularly impressive compared to some of the things that one reads about in newspapers. But the point is that this is reliable. It's absolutely clear. It's very highly significant. And so it can be trusted by doctors. And so they all uh, feel confident in using those, those drugs. Similarly, in no negative disease, we see uh, about a 3% improvement uh, in mortality as a result of radiotherapy to conserve breast. Carrying on with the theme, tamoxifen, endocrine uh, therapy, results at t in 15 years, because one of the 
one of the ways in which we work is to have continuously updated data from the trialists who are collaborating with us on the early breast cancer work. So we can look at mortality after 15 years, uh, and you can see here the substantial improvement in mortality, nearly a 10% improvement uh, over uh, 15 years. And we're carrying on with getting the data from all the trials so that we can continue to document the effects reliably of each of the regimens that's used and each of the interventions that's used in breast cancer. And by uh, aggregating those gains, over the years, there has been a dramatic improvement in breast cancer mortality. So if you look from the uh, mid-80s onwards, there's been a substantial fall, much of it due to uh, better treatments, uh, uh, and obviously also introduction of screening programs, but much of it has been due to better therapeutic regimens used uh, in, in women who have early breast cancer. So I think we can claim at least some credit for these falls and the work continues. That's cancer, now let's turn to vascular disease where in order to, to try to do something about vascular disease one first has to identify the causes of vascular disease uh, and distinguish those from the uh, risk factors which are not causes and then one has to uh, um, find ways of treating those causes. And we've done both. Not only have we done both with very large prospective studies and very large trials, but we've also arranged meta-analyses of the worldwide uh, uh, evidence from other studies. So by bringing it all together, we've been able to produce particularly reliable results. So again, let me illustrate. This is the prospective studies collaboration, which was uh, uh, around 60 prospective studies brought together by Sarah Lewington. I don't know if she's here. But Sarah Lewington uh, brought together these studies, about a million persons. And by organizing the data in a way that was reliable, she, sh she was able to show with her colleagues that total cholesterol, which includes bad cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, uh, is associated with an increased risk of heart disease at every age and also right down to low levels of cholesterol. And this, remarkably, was the first time we'd been able to see this properly analysed. Previously, there had been uh, not enough attention given to the, the details of the analysis, but Sarah and her colleagues did this properly. Similarly, with blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, the same sort of story. And you can see that older people are at higher risk and so bigger benefits, this is a logarithmic scale, bigger benefits may be obtained by lowering uh, blood pressure and cholesterol at older ages. Then the next thing uh, we were able to do was to demonstrate, this is particularly for cholesterol, that lowering cholesterol reduces risk. And although some of the smaller studies were equivocal, in this MRC-supported study, 20,000 patient heart protection study, the result was absolutely definitive. So we, we really aim to nail the problems when we, set, we take them on. It takes time, it takes money, it takes effort, but this nailed the problem. So really, after this study, there was really no more argument about whether cholesterol was a cause of heart disease, but we argue about the detail, but no argument really about whether cholesterol is a cause. Once that's done, what one needs to do is bring together all the randomized evidence in one place so that it can be analyzed in total. And we've done that in the cholesterol treatment trialist collaboration, the CTT. And this is a figure showing you how big the gains are in different types of situations. So uh, towards the back is higher risk patients, and towards the right is larger reductions in cholesterol. So if you get the, uh, the best possible situation where you're treating a high risk patient with a large, say, two millimole reduction in cholesterol, then a substantial benefit to be obtained from that. So only really by taking the trouble to run the big studies then taking the trouble to bring together all of the available evidence and then analysing it in a, way, in a way that's appropriate that is one is able to actually see these patterns for what they are. And again, we're not claiming that we have single-handedly uh, led to uh, uh, this dramatic reduction in vascular mortality over the years, but clearly treatment has had uh, some of the impact that we see here better living conditions and better social care and so on. But some of this is attributed to the treatment and so some of it is due to having clear evidence available for doctors who can then uniformly use these treatments in appropriate <coughs> ways. 
So that's really the why uh, of what we do. Uh, we want to focus on the big causes of disability and death. Uh, and we, we recognize that in each study, we're probably only going to be able to identify a moderate gain, but we're confident that by piling one of those gains upon the other, we gradually make a bigger impact on disease. So now let's turn to, to the detail of PHRU and its programs. And I've, I think that one of the things that I've done since I became director is to try to think about how we organize our work. And so what we've done is we've identified four themes that John alluded to earlier. We've got prospective studies, randomized trials, meta-analyses, and then this program of methodological innovation led by Martin Landre that's a new program uh, but which is absolutely key to what we do in the future. On the prospective study side, we've got the China Kadori study led by Zen Ming, Zen Ming Chen, uh, and then we have a, a program of studies in various parts of the world, all of which we are, are trying to study big problems, obesity, uh, blood pressure, uh, um, alcohol, smoking, in uh, various different populations. Because the truth is that the world is changing. We're seeing survival to middle age and beyond, and these risk factors are becoming more important for individual countries such as India, uh, uh, which is one of the places that, that, that Sarah is studying. Then we have a program of randomized trials in, in a number of different diseases. We've been focusing mainly on cardiovascular disease and metabolic disease, such as diabetes, a very big problem now uh, uh, worldwide, uh, increasingly on renal disease, and we're interested in migrating into other areas that are of concern, so things like that, um, dementia, which are becoming very important as a matter of uh, public mm -hmm. health concern. Mm -hmm. In the meta-analyses, we have breast cancer meta-analyses, I've already described, uh, which continues its work under Richard Gray, uh, and uh, uh, our own work on vascular disease uh, meta-analyses, and then, as I mentioned, Martin Landry. But underpinning that all, we have what we, we are calling enabling technologies, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time describing why that is so important for what we do. What we mean by enabling technologies is the work that is done by Mike Hill and his team in the Wolfson Laboratories. These are deliberately called epidemiological laboratories. They are developing specific, developing and applying specific methods that allow us to do these massive studies, and they are crucial to what we do. Similarly, we have a number of teams together that are working on systems development under Alan Young and Mike Lay, that without which we could not do what we do. And again, I'm going to say a little bit about that in, in the next few slides. So we came up with this schema for displaying how we do things. At the center of everything we do are the enabling technologies, the IT and the lab. This is the beating heart of what we do. Without this, we would not exist. And then we have enabling technologies feeding into each of the programs. So this makes the trials, the big trials possible in ways I'll describe. It makes the prospective studies possible in ways I'll describe, and so on. And it uh, will be vital to the methodological innovation that Martin is leading uh, as we go forward into the era of big data. So, uh, I've talked about the why, and I now want to talk a bit about the how. What, what is it that makes PHRU distinctive, or will make it distinctive? We aim to design studies that are definitive in the same way that we've always done in CTSU. We want to nail the answer to a problem. So we design things big, and, and we, they're, because they're big, they have to be cost efficient, because we, we don't have endless money. So we think very carefully about how we engineer our studies so that they are cost efficient and therefore large. <coughs> this requires us not only to think about technical solutions, but also just common sense solutions to making things streamlined. We don't have complexity when it doesn't serve a purpose. And Martin's work on methodological innovation, you'll hear about in a moment, really important as a way of ensuring that we can do things on a large scale. So why do we lead large numbers? Uh, is we all read our uh, journals every week and we see studies that are relatively small and they all tell us a bit about the disease and together they may help us to get a picture. But 
so much more is available when you really make studies big. So this is an example from the Prospective Studies Collaboration led by, by Sarah Lewington, in which we look at the uh, relationship between systolic blood pressure, on the bottom here, and the hazard ratio uh, for mortality. And at different ages, you can see that it's really difficult to pick out the true relationship between blood pressure and mortality. I think this is vascular mortality, actually, um, at different ages. You just can't tell what the true patterns are. That's in 5,000 people, which is about the size of the Framingham study that uh, everybody uh, raves about. Multiply that by 10. In the, this is from this perspective study, so we've still got some capacity left. But in 50,000, you can see that the patterns are beginning to emerge. There's a lot of zigging and zagging. You, you, know, you could be anywhere really here, but it, the rough pattern is now visible. Now, though, go to 500,000. And the true patterns, the real patterns that underlie the relationship between blood pressure and vascular mortality are starting to emerge from the mist. This is what we need, because this is what tells us how to go about treating people. This is no good to us. So if we're going to have studies of 500,000 people, as we now do with Zen Ming and uh, the UK Biobank from Rory, we've got to go about finding ways to make it possible to do that and to make it affordable. It's not only prospective studies where you need large size. Here's an example from randomized trials where the study would not be regarded as particularly small. This is the CARE study, Pravastatin, one of the statins, versus placebo, looking at uh, people at different levels of starting cholesterol. So this is people with moderate levels of cholesterol. This is people with relatively low cholesterol levels, although these days this is not thought of as being particularly low, but in those days it was. And you can see that about 4,000 people were randomized, and there were about 1,000 coronary events. And when you look at people who have particularly low cholesterol, it suggests the risk ratio here suggests that there's no effect. But these types of studies of this size are not capable of telling us the real answer. What we needed was another MRC study. I've already shown this slide uh, uh, embedded within another. You can see here the MRC study, of, uh, a BHF study, of heart protection study, showed that reducing cholesterol is effective not only in people with above average cholesterol, but also in people with levels that were low. So remember the rate ratio before was 1 with a wide confidence interval. Now we see the truth is that lowering cholesterol is effective in high-risk people however low you go. And we now know, uh, though I'm not going to show the data, we now know from the CTT meta-analysis that this is true right down to very low levels, right down to levels of 2 uh, millimoles per litre. And it's only by having the data and bringing it all together by having the large enough trials in the first place that one can get this information. And it does matter, because many people these days are at high risk but have average or below average cholesterol, and their risk can be reduced by new drugs. So I think I've made the argument, I hope I've made the argument for having large size. How do we use our enabling technologies to make it possible to do these very big studies? And I'm going to start off by describing the situation when we're thinking about doing prospective studies, how do our labs uh, and our program on methodological innovation help us to do really large prospective studies? And obviously, I'm choosing China Kodori because it, it, it was the first example of a very large uh, study that we're involved in. We later involved in bi UK Biobank, but this one was uh, driven forward by collaboration between uh, CTSU as it, uh, then and uh, the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. And between 2004 and 2008, half a million Chinese uh, were recruited in 10 centers. And you see here from this figure where they were in China. And Zeming will be able to tell us the details of the weather in each of them. This is the equivalent of the Mediterranean in, uh, in China. And this is the equivalent of Siberia uh, in China. And, and you can see that the there's a variation in uh, whether rural or sites were uh, uh, recruited or, or urban. And the IT team, part of CTSU's support for uh, uh, systems development, developed a simply I, 
uh, boggling uh, uh, array of programs and systems that allowed all the major functions that are necessary for doing something on that sort of scale to take place. So um, collecting survey data, so in every single person they had information uh, on baseline, questionnaire information, physical measurements, uh, blood collection, and then uh, necessity for, for systematic follow-up through health insurance systems and registries. All that requires a massive effort uh, to, to get the IT to work. So you, these are just examples of the different systems, all in Chinese, of course, uh, and we have the, the team here is able to do that. We can also do the things in English, uh, but the, the, the China team uh, has, done, uh, has, has blazed a trail. And I show this, this is the, the China Kadori website. Uh, I'm showing it partly because I want to show that we are now uh, well ahead with our efforts to make data available from this study. And then we moved on to the, two, the UK Biobank study. As Rory has described at the beginning in his introduction, uh, we were able to help out with uh, getting the UK Biobank study on track because of our experience, because of the long-standing investment from the MRC that had allowed us to, to do China Kadori and other big studies. We were simply ready to roll with getting the UK Biobank um, recruitment centers, as a recruitment center here, um, with all the, the kit that was needed to do automated measurement, touch screen consent, touch screen uh, uh, surveys and so on. And all these systems were developed by Alan Young, who's in the audience, but is also on this slide, because he, uh, he uh, is the person doing all the destructive testing of his programs, uh, trying to break the system that measures uh, lung function, and trying to break, break the exercise bike. And so Alan, as a consequence, looks much younger than he really is. <laughs> so that's one example of where we've already made things work. China Kadori, UK Biobank, both working very well. There are issues with making sure we have enough funding, but there always are. I want to move now to a situation, well, to, to a different example. I've talked about how uh, IT is critical to our, to, to our work. And I want to talk about how the other enabling technology, the lab, has allowed us to develop the Mexican study, the Mexico City Perspective Study. And this is a study uh, of 150,000 people in a, in, a, in a couple of districts in, in Mexico City, 100,000 women, 50,000 men. Uh, it was started uh, about 15 years ago. And in that situation, the... Uh, I think they went around in vans and, and knocked on people's doors and asked them if they could uh, um, take a measurement of blood pressure and do some questionnaires and, and take some blood. And 150,000 people were recruited into that study. And what's remarkable about this study is it allows us a window on what happens when you have populations with severe levels of obesity. So if you look here at the distribution of body mass index uh, and the proportion with BMI greater than 30, these are extraordinary levels of obesity in both men and women, particularly women. And of course, as a result of that, there are extraordinary levels of diabetes in this population. So that by the time uh, you reach the age of 70, over a, around a quarter of women and about 20% of men are diabetic. And th this is really uh, very extraordinary and very worrying. Um, when we look at the levels of um, hemoglobin A1c, which is a measurement of the amount of glucose attached to hemoglobin, it gives you a sort of window on how bad the glucose levels have been in blood over time. Those with diabetes have very high levels of hemoglobin A1c, suggesting that they're inadequately treated. And those without diagnosed diabetes have quite high levels of HbA1c, suggesting that they are, if you like, pre-diabetic, or many of them are pre-diabetic. So we've got the two, this is a description of two disasters going on at the same time. So I've shown this already. What does that lead to in terms of mortality? Well, what we see is that young, in young uh, men and women, the risks associated with diabetes are five times those without diabetes. And these are really enormous risks, uh, and they are unprecedented worldwide because we really have quite special population here that is giving us an indication of what happens if you have extreme exposure to, to obesity and to diabetes. 
with an adequate deep treatment. The, the best way to look at this is to, this is the rates of, de of death from between ages and 35 and 74 uh, among those uh, with and without previously diagnosed diabetes. So the white is what you would have if you had no diabetes. And then the blue is the extra mortality you get from being diabetic. And I think this will interest John particularly because you see here that this is diabetic renal mortality. We only know this because of the work of Will Harrington, who's a nephrologist who joined to work with us on SHARP and was interested in looking at the death certificates for uh, the Mexico study. And what he discovered was that patients dying with diabetes weren't dying from diabetic crisis. They were actually dying from end-stage renal disease. What this really means is that patients are presenting with diabetes when they already have uh, microvascular disease and therefore have some renal impairment already. And they're not getting treated. Uh, they're not getting treated for their renal disease and so they're dying. So this is a very interesting situation but we need to understand it better. And the reason for showing you this is because this wouldn't be possible without our labs. Because there aren't many places that would be able to measure 156,000 uh, HbA1c's uh, in 17 months. That's 2,500 a week. And of course the, the key thing was that we had buffy coats and we needed to develop a method to analyse HbA1c in a buffy coat. And that was done by Mike, Mike Hill and his team. He had his staff on the ground in Mexico helping with the field work. They supervised the logistics of shipping the blood to his lab. And then they did the analyses, all with very commendable QC. So again, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without the labs in this particular study, they make it possible. So that's a way of leading into what else the lab does in terms of supporting C uh, PHRU's work. They are involved in developing methods. So for example, the LDL method, the beta quant method, the reveal trial is absolutely essential because in the anisotropy treated patients, uh, the, the, the received method underestimates LDL cholesterol. And then we've now got an NMR machine and that's being developed so that we can do lots of uh, interesting analyses on uh, these, our various studies. There are different methods, developments going on, for example, looking at uh, albumin in uh, blood when it's, when it's uh, enduring, when it's uh, transported. We've been helping with validation of other projects, so UK Biobank and the, the uh, NIHR National Biosample Centre. Mike spends a lot of his time helping with validation. And then he has all these regulations to deal with. So a lot uh, really comes out of the funding that has gone into the lab from the MRC over the years that allows us to do these types of studies. And the final example I want to give of how our enabling technologies feed into our work is the way in which they support uh, the trials and the way in which methodological innovation, which of course feeds off the uh, IT development uh, on trials. So this is an example of a trial called REVEAL, which is being uh, run, the PIs are, are Martin Landre and Louise Bowman. And the trial has now fully recruited 30,000 patients uh, 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 worldwide and will be reporting shortly uh, in the next year or so. But I want to show this example because this is this is about methodological development. It's not the type of methodology development that, that may be thought of as being more typical, where, for example, you develop a new method of analyzing data. This is about developing a method that allows you to do your study efficiently. And we think this is the, the most important type of methodological development that, uh, that is really <coughs> needed because we need to do things cost-effectively at scale. This is how we uh, get reliable results. So. The study had to recruit 30,000 patients, and the aim was to work with a group in, in America to recruit, that was their, their, group, their um, target, this is the Timmy group in America, and they had their own ways of, they had their own sites, and they worked with Martin and uh, Louise to identify how they would do it, and they would take um, about 15 months to recruit 7,500 patients. But the innovation, the methodological innovation that uh, that Martin and Louise and Rory came up with 
was to, to insist that before centres could get involved with the study, they had to pre-screen their patients so that they had lists of substantial numbers of patients ready to roll the moment that the study started to have, if you like, pre-screened them. So this is an efficient way of ensuring, first of all, that the site actually has the patients because you couldn't get into the study unless you were able to provide a list uh, or, or prove that you had a list of that number of patients. And then you weren't allowed to start until you had it. So when they did start, despite having been sceptical about its value, they were able to recruit in a relatively small number of centres in a much shorter time, about half the time took, taken to recruit. Now we've done this since, this method in the UK HEART3 study in, dialysis, in um, pre-dialysis and dialysis patients, we see exactly the same thing. It's a very simple idea, but it makes such a difference to being able to do big, big studies. Another example of innovation, this time statistical, many randomised trials spend huge amounts of money sending uh, staff around the world to check source data. Most of it, complete waste of time. But what we can do is we can look at the data that come into the, uh, into the coordinating centre and do standard checks of the sort of range of consistency and completeness of data to identify outlying sites, sites that are not doing a good job. We can look at unusual distributions of data, and we can um, also look at quality control assessments in random samples. And these are three different ways of cutting the costs, of homing in on those sites that are most likely, a priori, to have a problem. And just one example of where that was done. This was done in the, actually in the SHARP study in 9,000 patients who, with renal disease. Each point is a site. And uh, it's the number of sites along the bottom that had at least one reported serious adverse event, so something that got a patient into hospital. And on the right-hand side here, I'm sorry, on the left-hand side, you've got the expected number. And what you should see is everything should lie along the line uh, with gradient 1. If you look at the observed minus expected and identify those where there are many fewer than you expect to see, this may suggest there's a problem. The nurses are not identifying the events, not being recorded properly, whatever the explanation. This is a site that deserves a visit. And that's how we prioritised our uh, monitoring visits at the time of Sharp. This is a much more efficient way of supporting and training sites than just sending uh, people out on an aeroplane frequently to measure source data. It costs hundreds of millions of pounds to run these types of studies. It's a, a very simple way of reducing costs. Now, I'm going to, not going to run through the detail. I've talked about the why, I've talked about the how, and now here's the what. This is what we are currently doing. Um, we've talked about China Kodori. We have in the audience uh, the, the program leaders for all these uh, programs. They can describe the detail, but I'll just mention a few things. So, genetic studies in China Kodori, very high priority for us. We think this is a very efficient way of getting a lot of science for relatively low cost, the cost of genetics falling uh, rapidly over time. We think it's important to understand how disease varies, uh, disease rates vary in association with particular risk factors in different countries, at different stages of um, demographic transition. We're going to carry on doing very large trials. This might not look like many trials, but this one's 30,000 patients, and the ASCEND study of aspirin in diabetes is 15,000, run entirely by mail. Um, we're going to carry on doing studies in vascular disease and renal disease, but we're also thinking about doing studies in degenerative disease, including dementia. We're going to carry on with the breast cancer meta-analyses, and uh, Richard Gray could talk a bit more about what we're currently doing there. And we're working now, perhaps the big thing on the vascular disease meta-analyses is uh, looking at safety of statins, the big hoo-ha uh, that Rory's been particularly involved in. We are now getting the data so that we can, as it were, nail the problem. And then Martin's stuff on big data and informatics, uh, I'm sure he'll be able to talk about that in detail. But this is absolutely critical with our link with the big data to being able to deliver on the promise that we have now from uh, these types of... Uh, uh, collections of data. The enabling technologies, they don't stand still. Uh, they're, they're developing metabolomics in, uh, in the lab. 
Uh, they're continuing to develop different assays, and they're involved in helping with knowledge transfer to other big facilities. And we continue to develop our trial management systems. This is how we've been able to do bigger and bigger, more international studies over the years. We had the small investment to start with, and then it gradually grew as it became more successful. And that's what we want to carry on doing. So the future of the PHRU, I think there are some very big opportunities that we need to, to, to grab. First, the link with the Big Data Institute. There's the, the URL for that if you're interested. Uh, not just fast disease and cancer, but if you have big, big data, you can look at less common diseases because there are more events, enough events to be able to actually get some purchase on the problem. So this is our way of getting into less common chronic diseases uh, uh, to, to try to get a better understanding of them. The large perspective studies in Mexico and China are very important. Mexico is a particular target for us. We want to be able to analyze the bloods that are stored for Mexico. I, I've shown you the data. It's alarming. We need to get the bloods analyzed. Sorry. Um, we have new randomized trials planned, particularly in diabetes and renal disease. And we are also carrying on with our work, our advocacy work, to try to reduce the barriers to doing big trials. We can't do big trials if they can't be done because of barriers. So we need to spend enough time trying to deal with that. And Tim Sprozen is particularly engaged with the More Trials campaign to try and get public support for that. This is the Big Data Institute from the air. Uh, we ought to get a drone so that we can get an update for that. Uh, but. Uh, uh, there's, a, there's a bit of a mess around here at the moment, but the building's basically up and we're opening it as, uh, as we were told in, in May or so. So what are our challenges? Uh, I've, I've, I've been very upbeat about what I think our opportunities are. I think we need to solve some of the problems that we have. The most obvious one is funding. If you have very big studies, you need a lot of money uh, to be able to make them really work. Uh, we can be efficient, but we still need enough money to keep the day-to-day -day operation going. No good having a collection of blood and a collection of baseline data if you don't know what's happening to people. And so you need long-term support for following people up reliably. <coughs> you could do some of that through uh, electronic records, but much of it is, uh, requires big effort from people sitting on a seat and actually thinking about what to do. So we need to find a way of funding uh, for China Kadori and Mexico, we need, probably need consortia of funders to do that. We're thinking about that. We want to get the genes measured in the Mexico study because we think there might be uh, reasons to believe that, for example, the, the, the Hispanic population in Mexico may differ to the Western population. We want to be able to study that. We think that's important. The second thing we want to do is to develop careers. Now, looking around the room, the senior scientists in the PHRU I can tell you they're not as young as they look, uh, uh, and they will eventually need replacing. So we will, we 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 were ser we were serious about trying to encourage new blood within the, the middle ranks of of PHRU. We already have three new recruits since I became director, and we're trying to do more. But it depends on funding, and it depends on the uh, uh, availability of appropriate candidates. The third thing we need to do is training. Uh, we recognize the need to do more on DPhils, on PhDs. Part of the reason we weren't able to do this previously was because we were set up in a way that didn't encourage people to come into population health. We are dealing with that now. And what we want to do is we want to find a way to get an MRC-specific program. When I was interviewed by the MRC Strategy Board, I was asked, what sort of program will you get for the MRC PHRU? I haven't been able to find an answer to that. We need to find an answer. We're particularly keen on the idea of a four-year defill in population health, allowing um, students to rotate to maybe two or three labs at the beginning and then go on to choose their, their topic. So those are aspirations. I'm sure we'll find ways to deal with them, but that, those are the big challenges we face. So to conclude, I think we're entering an, a new era, enormous potential for exploring disease causation through big data in particular, to, uh, through the new technologies, metabolomics, genomics. New drug targets are bound to emerge, but we need to be able to do the big trials to demonstrate that drugs are both safe and effective. 
Uh, it, it's no good having a, a great drug if you don't know whether it's safe. So we'd still need the big trials. We still need to be able to do the, um, the studies. We are going to engage with that, and we'll work with anybody who wants to work with us who shares our vision of trying to improve public health through really big studies that are reliable. So that's my last slide, but I want to just finish off by giving a, a glimpse of the, our new website. Please do go and have a look at it, and you'll be able to read more about what I've described if you go there and have a look. So thank you very much.